Hey guys, Elizabeth Curly Head Country Gal here. Now this is only my second live. I'm so excited about this. Now, if you may or may not have noticed that I haven't been posting as many videos recently over the past, I don't know, week, week and a half or so. The main reason for that is I, I think being pretty busy learn. Oh, what I've been doing is I've been editing a video, a very, very long collaboration about meat rabbits, which I'm very excited about. But I wanted to jump on here today because I just got done chatting with April at Higher Grounds. Uh, let's see, what is it called? I think she's, I think that her business is just called Higher Ground. Oh, sorry. Higher Ground Herbs and Homestead. And her name is April. And we got to chat about Cooney Coonies and it was awesome. So I wanted to jump on before I forget what she said. I took some notes. And we were in a room together on Facebook and we thought that it saved, but it didn't. So I want to share some of the things that she told me that have been very helpful. I've also been chatting with Tom Wiley over at the home study. The, oh man, I'm going to get it wrong again. The, oh, Tom, I'm sorry. I don't have it rem memorized yet. I should know this by now. Uh, Tom Wiley is at the... Uh, I'm like just blanking the handy homesteader Tom I should know that by now I'm so sorry but I also have been talking with Tom at the handy homesteader and I got to chat with Adam from Greenwood Farms Good Life Farms and there's been a consistent theme of rotational grazing so I've been learning more about rotational grazing I've been <clears throat> wondering how to implement it and getting perspectives on different methodologies. So I'm going to chat another time about what Tom and I have been talking about and what Adam shared about with us as well. But right now, I just want to share some of the thoughts that April had that were super helpful because I'm brand new to pigs. And I actually had a video a little while ago where I talked about the um, setup that I was going to have for pigs and the fencing, etc. But I think I'm going to go a totally different route, which is a little bit of a bummer because I'm going to have to change some of the infrastructure that I set up. But it's also exciting because um, I want to do it right the first time. And you just don't know what you don't know. So I, I did the best with what I could. Um, but I think I might have to undo some of the stuff that I did. So at least I didn't get too far. We put in a bunch of T-posts. I think I'm going to end up pulling those back out and either saving them or selling them. But anyway, um, oh, nice. I saw some people join me for a second. Thanks, whoever that was. So again, I'm going to start from ground zero with Cooney Coonies just for a few minutes. I'm actually in between Spanish classes. This is my setup for teaching Spanish classes. I have my picture that my daughter drew for me. This is me uh, with the really colorful jumpsuit. <laughs> and this is my husband. And then our four kids are there. We've got two curly haired ones in the middle and then girl and boy. Anyway, <laughs> so. Here, is some, here are some of the things that April was telling me. First of all, she does a no treatment setup, which is exactly what I want to do. So I asked kind of just generally about that. How do you go about having no treatment? <clears throat> and her encouragement was, well, you can't change the pigs. So you have to be willing to change the environment that the pigs are in if things aren't working. Sorry, it's kind of dark in here all of a sudden. Um, so that was helpful. And it's just like people. You, we can't change our biology, but we can change what we put into our bodies. Now, we talked for quite a while about fencing. So I thought that I had a good plan going with four different paddocks for rotationally grazing pigs. And I'm going to share my screen here if I can and show you just what I've been brainstorming. Let's see if I can do that when I'm live or not. Do, 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 do. Maybe I can't share my screen. I have a video up of my of our property, but we have a two acre kind of horseshoe shape and that already has field fencing around it. And then there's our driveway and then there's a one acre parcel. And or, uh, actually maybe it's a little more than that. And then we have another about acre that's mostly wooded. And so let me go back to my notes here. So with fencing, I thought that I was going to section off every paddock and rotationally graze the animals through it. But everybody I've been hearing, you know, whether it's Tom or Adam or Joel Salatin or uh, Judy, oh, I always forget his name, Greg Judy, 
they say, no, don't make it permanent. You can make the external perimeter permanent, but not the individual paddocks. And part of the reason is that you need to be an observer of what's happening with the land and how much the animals are eating and what they're not eating and knowing what paddock size works. And if suddenly one of your animals dies, then you don't need as big of a paddock for them to rotate through. So that was a big change. So we talked about fencing. She rec- she she uses and recommends Premier One, and she's been using their poly wire with step-in posts. This is all new to me, but I'm starting to get an idea of what materials people use. So it's the posts with the little hooks on them. You put the poly wire on it. You, you make a circle, you know, how it, or you hook it to the end of something using a, a non-conductive hook. And then you put a solar charger, which is, well, you can put a solar charger and then you make it hot and then you're good to go. And she strings three wires for her pigs. Well, she, th- she strings three wires because she has all of her animals rotate together. So she puts a wire approximately six inches above the ground, approximately 12 inches and a, or approximately 18 inches and then approximately, I don't know, 30 inches. And it's just kind of the nose height of whatever animal she has in there. Um, so. The reason for the six inches is for piglets. The reason for the 18 inches is for older pigs. And then 30 inches is to keep the cows from getting excited and getting out or a sheep. So she uses solar chargers and she uses the biggest one from Premier One. And she actually doesn't train her pigs to fencing, which was interesting to me. Um, Oh, hey, Chuck, good to see you. Oh, nice. Yeah, I know. I just jumped on kind of randomly today. Because I, I got to have an awesome talk with April at Higher Grounds Homestead. And if you're looking for her on Facebook, if you're interested in Cooney Cooney Pigs that haven't been vaccinated or Highland Cows, she is at the Facebook group that she is the, the, the moderator of is Southern U.S. Cooney Cooney Conservators. So if you're interested in that, you can check that out. So that's what I'm chatting about. Brainst- I'm just kind of processing what I shared with her or what she shared with me because I'm totally new to this. So permanent perimeter fencing, but then you subdivide the insides. Um, I asked, there's a, there's a seasonal creek that goes through part of the area that I'm interested in. And I wondered, should I keep the fence away from the creek or should I go ahead and do the fence past the creek? She said, just go ahead and do it past the creek. They'll have more fresh water. So that was helpful. Um, by the way, Chuck, how you doing? Thanks for hopping on. That's so nice of you. Um, and then she talked a little bit about some of the supplies. She uses a high tensile electric fence around the perimeter, largely because it's the least expensive way to go. Good. You're doing fantastic. Um, all of this is new to me. So it's like, I finally have a grasp on field fencing. Oh no, now I need to learn about electric fencing. Oh no, now I need to learn about high tensile electric fencing, but it's okay. We'll get there one, one step at a time. She recommends, um, uh, or she uses a company called Ken Cove, K-E-N. K-E-N-C-O-V-E. And um, and so there's there's pros and cons to every kind of fencing. If you have field fencing, it's it's there for life until a cow a cow falls on it, until a tree falls on it. But if uh, but it doesn't give the animals a shock. Um, on the other hand, solar gives them, you know, an electric fence gives them a shock, but it might not keep them in all the time. So I was assuming I would keep my pigs over here and I would do my cows and sheep over here. And and her recommendation is no, just do them all together. So she's a big proponent of multi-species grazing. She runs Jacob sheep, Highland cows, and Cooney Cooney pigs all together. And she doesn't do rotationally grazing per se because she doesn't move them super regularly but it's all part of that regenerative agriculture idea of keeping animals together, supporting the health of the land, et cetera. Yep. Like Chuck said, if they get along, go for it, which, you know, if you, they, they, they have been for her. So with rotational grazing, she did mention that observation is key. Um, and that's what I've heard from Tom Wiley at the Handy Home Center and Adam Bowman, that you just have to see what the animals are eating. And if they're eating everything down, then you need to move them. And if they're if they're not eating, th- eating things down in the time that you want to move them, you gave them a paddock that was too big. Um, by the way, Chuck, if are, are you doing any, I know you're doing rabbits. Are, do you have any larger animals, cows, pigs, 
I forget if you do. I'm, I'm curious. And anybody else watching this later, tell me what you have too. Because uh, this is a, just a big new thing that I'm really excited about, but it's just all new. So we talked about rotational grazing. She has four pens right now. Yep. Okay. So Chuck, you got the small animals too. Are you thinking about going with larger animals, cows, pigs in the future? I'm curious. Um, so anyway, so I was asking her, okay, well, how do you move animals? And she's, I loved her response because she says that she gets to know each of her animals and she knows if some animals will respond to her with food or if some will respond by her calling or if some will respond by her just opening a gate. So she, she said that uh, she can quietly go get the goats sequestered because they are always just kind of watching her when she's out there. And then she'll rattle some feed to get the pigs to move. And then she'll open the fence and pour some feed in the trough to get the cows to move out. So that'll be just a, a part of the adventure of moving animals is figuring out how to move different species and getting them from one place to the next you know, safely and where everybody's happy. Oh, nice. You guys have talked about getting beef cows. Cool. Yeah. Beef cows or a milk cow is what we're looking at down the road. So she gave some ideas about how to move them. You want to make it stress-free. She said it's more stressful for the humans than for the animals normally. And she has a central hub where her solar charger is. I don't totally understand how that works or how that would work for my setup. I kind of picture having different chargers in different areas. Um, but then she recommended maybe having an alley, especially if you have cattle, they're going to need some sort of a lane or, um, or a chute if you plan on getting them back up into a trailer to be sold or to go to process. Um, so I was asking, about, asking her about tr training cows to get to the trailer. And then we started talking about cows. She has highlands. It's the, the ones with the long hair, the long horns. They're beautiful. You've probably seen them. And I was considering those or Dexter's. At first, I wanted to go with the American Milking Devon, which is a, just a cool heritage breed. Um, it's, I guess it's the breed that George Washington had on his homestead. It was a, I don't know. Anyway, it's a, it's a dual purpose meat and milk cow, but they're rare. So they're very expensive. And so then I thought, okay, well, I'll go with a Dexter and I can get a Dexter from owners who haven't used vaccines because that's a big thing Adam talked about and Tom, that you don't, if you're going to have a system where your animals aren't vaccinated, you need to get stock that's not vaccinated. Otherwise, it's just going to be an uphill battle. So she has Highlands though. And she said Highlands and Dexters share a lot of positive characteristics. She said they're both good mothers. They're good at calving. They're not bred to crazy American standards um, as far as, I don't know, tons of milk production, and they're more docile. Um, with Dexter, Dexter specifically, she said they're not quite as eager to please, she has observed, um, but they are less expensive. However, oh, yep, yeah, like Chuck said, Dexter seemed to be pr fairly popular. That's what I, that's what, what I, the gist I seem to be getting is that they're more accessible and they're also smaller than a Jersey or... I don't know very many different kinds of breeds. I basically know these four now. <laughs> so the other advantage to Highlands, she said, is that they have a, a lower metabolism. So they actually eat less. And she says that the, she just swears by how docile they are. Um, anyway, I, I asked her about foliage on the wires. How do they, how does she keep the foliage off? She said, first, you could go through and just whack everything down, put up your fencing. You know, you put the stakes in, you hang your poly wire and you're good to go, um, or the and the animals will just eat, continue to eat around there. So I'm still curious about how that's going to work logistically with moving them so often into a bunch of different paddocks. Because Adam Bowman at the oh what's it called Ozark Homesteading Festival, he recommends if you're going to rotationally graze to have 20 different paddocks. So that's and the purpose is because you want to move them often. And get them into the routine of moving often, and then if they're in, if they go to twenty different paddocks, but they're only there for two days, that's forty days—a forty-day cycle from the from the first paddock back to the first paddock, and that's great because you, you want to shoot for. I think it was somewhere like thirty to fifty days of, of leaving a pasture to rest, and so that would be totally that's so it's a lot of paddocks. But it's just really great for the ground and it's really great for the animals to constantly have different different 
foliage. And that was one reason why April recommended putting the animals all together is because I have pasture. I have a little bit more of a marshy area where there's a seasonal spring that comes through and then a wooded area. And she said, yeah, get them in all those areas because they're going to benefit from all those areas. They're going to get the high tannin foods like tree bark from the wooded area and naturally deworm that way. And then there's other things that they're going to get in the pasture. Hey, welcome back, Chuck. And he just said, oh, yep. Yep, yep, yep. And it just seems like he was talking about how um, it's recommended to move animals often. Yeah, I, I get that's just I, that was just totally new to me. I, this is this is all very new, but I'm glad to be learning it now before we have animals and a whole bunch of money into infrastructure. So it's a little daunting. But the last thing we talked about, I have to get going in about five minutes to teach a Spanish class, <laughs> but I wanted to jump on here so I could process what I learned. And so we talked about feed for a few minutes. And so I asked her, okay, uh, I want to do this as low cost as possible. I want to graze. This is part of the reason I want Cooney Coonies is so I don't have to pay for a whole bunch of feed. Can I just graze my cows and pigs? And she says that she does bring in some hay, but she says that it is possible in, in her climate, which is south of here. Uh, and it just depends on how much you move them and how many animals you have, what the... Oh, there's a, a term for, I forget, it's very common, but it's a term for how much, uh, how many pounds of livestock your land can support. Do you know what I'm talking about, Chuck? It's, I forget. And then there's some like ruler thing that helps you calculate how many pounds of animals your, an acre can support. Anyway, so she does bring in hay and... She said that if I really got into regenerative grazing, you could at least extend the grazing season and reduce the amount that you have to input as far as feed costs. She says that she gets round bales that are a thousand pounds about. And last winter she had 12 cattle on it and they would go through about one bale a week. And again, keeping in mind that highlands have a lower metabolism so they don't eat as much. But then when it hit January, they went up to about two bales a week. And so that's the, just some hard numbers from her. And so what she did was she, she, she has a field had or has a field share where uh, somebody cuts it and then they bring it to her. Uh, and so you either need to have somebody deliver it or have a hay trailer. Uh, so again, just, you have to think through logistics. I need to think through logistics of, okay, if I'm going to have animals, how am I going to get hay here? How much is that going to cost? Am I going to cover it? Should I cover it? And she was kind of like, yeah, you should probably cover it. Hers is kept in a barn. Um, so anyway, whew, that is my quick 18 minute quick <laughs> overview of my conversation with April from Higher Grounds Herbs and Homestead. She's in Alabama, Union Grove. I thought she was in Union Grove, Arkansas, which would have been great because that would have been like two hours from me. But she's in Union Grove, Alabama, which is way longer, way farther away from me. If you're interested in looking, getting more information from her, she's been super helpful. Again, her Facebook page is Southern U.S. Cooney Cooney Conservators. And she just recently did a pig swap with, um, oh, I forget. I've seen the name before, Snake something uh, and somebody else. So anyway, oh, yeah, Snake Doctor Farmstead and Carlisle Acres. So anyway. Chuck, thanks so much for hopping on. And I hope this is helpful for any of you thinking about getting into pigs, rotational grazing, etc. It's all a little daunting, but slowly but surely, like how you eat an elephant, I guess. <laughs> thanks for joining me. Bye.